السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أيها الكافرون لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد لكم دينكم ولي دين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're beginning today inshallah ta'ala and hopefully concluding also the study of Surah Al-Kafirun uh, This is one of the surahs that the study of which has always intimidated me personally because of the uh, simple language, but the repetition in the language, and sometimes we, uh, you know, nothing is quite as, as simple as it seems in Allah's book, and we have to do a deep study and analysis, and try and understand the wisdom of things to the best of our ability, and take advantage of the works of the scholars that have spent decades trying to figure these ayat out, and try to figure out the lessons in them. Um, and so... You know, it's something I've been putting off for a long time. So this, alhamdulillah, this dars was an opportunity for me to review these lessons and do my own research and uh, take advantage of the works of great mufassirun in the past. And I had tons and tons and tons of notes to share with you. And I realized something. I better, need, I better water this stuff down and I better present these lessons in easy to understand language because if I went through my notes, you wouldn't get anything. Uh, they're, they're pretty complicated, the, the linguistic discussions and the... The, the literary analysis of the surah is pretty complex, so I'm gonna, I, I rewrote all of my notes, kind of why I'm late actually. I had to go through my notes and try to rewrite them, and I'll try to present these things in a coherent fashion, being true to what has been said in our scholarly tradition, but at the same time trying to simplify some of those things or present them at least in easier to understand language. The first things first, the connection between this surah and the surah that precedes it, Surah Al-Kawthar, the study of which we concluded last week, in Surah Al-Kawthar, the kuffar had insulted the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they had called him, you know, Batara Muhammadun, right? Uh, so that language Allah Azza wa Jal responded to in the last ayah when he said, Inna shani'aka wal abtar. But you know, when they call you something, Allah Azza wa Jal has now given the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also the right to call them something back. And instead of insulting them, the power, the, what Allah told to tell His Messenger, the word He used for them was Al-Kafirun. So from the very beginning, it's not even Ya Ayyuh Al-Kafirun, it's Qul Ya Ayyuh Al-Kafirun. In other words, Allah tells His Messenger to now call them Al-Kafirun. The insult they hurled against the Messenger was Abtar. And the insult that is hurled against them by Allah is the word Al-Kafir, is the word Al-Kafirun. And we'll look more into that inshaAllah ta'ala. And uh, the difference between how they insulted the messenger or tried to, and how Allah is hurling an insult back at them. The first thing was their insult actually didn't have any reality. The reality of his name, his legacy not being mentioned anymore, wasn't, it just wasn't true. Actually, it's the exact opposite. His mention will be made till the day of judgment, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he is someone that is the farthest from abtar. On the other hand, the allegation Allah makes against them, and the, the, the name He calls them, Al-Kafirun, fits perfectly. Another difference is when Allah, when they made a criticism, it wasn't a criticism of any of the character, or the behavior, or the actions of the Prophet Because there's nothing to criticize. But when Allah criticizes them, He uses a name, an attribute, that is actually tied to an action. So it's not just a bad word for them, but kafir, which you all know, common translation says disbeliever, or denier or rejecter is some, a crime that they are actually guilty of. It is actually something that is blameworthy in its essence. These are two differences. The second is in the end of the surah, Allah Azza wa said, "Inna shani ak al abtar." He called them the enemy, and shani, as we said, is the worst kind of enemy. 
And now it is as though we are learning Allah's definition of who is the enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the one who is bent upon kufr after years and years and years of da'wah, after years and years of the softest approach, years and years of warning, these people don't get it. And they are still against not only this message, but they're insulting the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. on top of that. These people, because of their kufr, are the worst kind of enemy. So even in, instead of calling them shani, Allah calls them kafir because to him there is no difference. You know in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jalla, later on in Madani Qur'an, He commands His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa He says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيِّ جَاهِدِ الْكُفَّارِ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ وَغْلُبْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمَ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ Right? Make struggle and make jihad against the kuffar and the munafiqeen and be harsh towards them. Commanding the Messenger to be harsh towards them. And this is, and we'll see why Allah commands His Messenger to be harsh towards them a little bit later on when we get to the ayat when we study that the Messenger by nature is not harsh. He's very soft and he's very merciful. And there are ayat after ayat after ayat dedicated to how soft and merciful the Messenger is sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And even in the Meccan Qur'an when Allah's Messenger talks to the kuffar in the, in the ayat that are preceding this ayah, he's always soft with them. He's always soft. This is a very, very tough ayah. One of the toughest ayat in the Qur'an revealed against the people of disbelief. The other thing is that these kuffar, you know, they outnumbered the believers. And they outpowered them too. They were in the position of political power. They were in the position of social status. And because of that power and status, and on top of that, them claiming that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't even have sons to carry his name, they felt that they were in a position of strength and the Prophet in a position of weakness. And because of this, they, would, they felt they're in a position to pressure him. And one of the things they offered him as a, you know, as a compromise was, and you've heard this before perhaps, we'll, we're willing to accept your religion for a year, and you accept our religion the next year. And then we'll come back to yours this next year, and we'll all share, I mean, in other words, we all share Islam for a season, then we'll all share shirk for a season. Then we'll share Islam for a season. So give and take, give and take. Or we're willing to give you a little bit of wealth, or this or that, you just leave us alone. You don't bother us in terms of our, our practices. So they were offering this compromise. Actually, this compromise and this, this, this sentiment that they had, it tells you two things. One, they figured out that this man will never stop calling for what he's calling for. And we're not letting go of what we have either. So the only solution in this kind of political situation, what, you know what they call it? A political compromise. You give a little, we give a little, right? So the, you know, in the Qur'an, Allah says, وَدُّوا لَوْ تُدْهِنُوا فَيُدْهِنُونَ they really want that you soften up a little bit, so they can soften up a little bit. So you give a little and we give a little, we'll both compromise a little bit, and then we'll all be happy. That's what they want. In other words, they don't necessarily want, they've understood that you're never gonna give up Islam altogether, so they'll just try to take a piece of it. And they have understood that, they're, that they're, you're never gonna accept their religion, so we're not asking you to accept all of it, just accept some of it, a little bit of it. By the way, this is one of the tricks of shaitan. The Quraysh are using a classic trick of shaitan. Allah Azza wa says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, udkhulu fi silmi kafatan, wa la tattabi'u khutuwata shaitan. Those of you who believe, who claim to believe, enter into the fold of Islam, enter into submission completely and absolutely, while not following the footsteps of shaitan. In other words, entering into Islam, but not completely, is a footstep of, is following the footsteps of Shaitan. Shaitan doesn't want you to leave Islam. He just wants you to compromise a little bit of it. Just, you know, give me a little. And the next time he'll come around and ask for a little more. And then a little more. My teacher used to give the example of a dam. You know, the dam that's holding the water. And there's a little tiny crack. You don't have to destroy the entire dam. All you need to do is make one little crack. Because what's going to happen over time? It's going to get bigger and bigger until the whole thing's gone. You don't have to blow the whole thing up. You just need to make that first crack. And the rest will take care of itself. So this was the strategy that they had employed. But since in the previous surah, Allah has done two things. One, Allah has given the messenger so much that you can't pay him with anything that can compete. Allah has given his messenger, Al-Kawthar. Inna a'taynaka Al-Kawthar. So no matter what you give him, you give him power, you give him money, you give him wealth. You can't give him anything now that can ever compete with what Allah has already given him. So there's the bribery is gone. There's no incentive left. On top of that, you can't threaten him. Because in the previous surah, what happened to the enemy? In Nashani Aka, who al Abdar, the enemy is gone. He's taken care of by Allah Azza wa Jal. So at this point, you don't need to be afraid, and you don't need to give in to any of these proposals for compromise. You go straight to their face and you tell them, Ya ayyuhal kafirun, 
قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ It's a profound placement of the surah, you know, connected with the surah before it. So, أَمَّا الْآنَ لَمَّا قَوَيْنَا قَلْبَكَ بِقَوْلِنَا It is as though Allah is saying, now that we have given your heart strength with our words, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرَ وَبِقَوْلِنَا إِنَّا شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرَ Because of those statements of ours that we have given you, فَلَا تُبَالِ بِهِمْ Then don't care about them. وَلَا تَلْتَفِتْ إِلَيْهِمْ And don't turn towards them anymore. You don't need to. You don't need to be concerned with what they going to think on what how they're going to react. فَقُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ now a few introductory comments. So these were a few comments of what connects this surah to the previous one, but now a few introductory comments. They were willing to give a little bit. They were willing to give a little bit. But still Allah called them al-kafirun. Allah didn't call them compromisers, or proposers of compromise, or even mushrikun. He called them in this surah, kafirun. And this is really important to understand. You know, typically, the, the people who disbelieve in the Qur'an, they are called الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And there's only one place in the Qur'an where they are addressed directly. And that is in Surah Al-Tahreem. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا الْيَوْمِ إِنَّمَا تُجْزَوْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ And that ayah, inshaAllah, one day when we get to it, we'll understand that ayah is when they are being addressed on the Day of Judgment. They are being addressed on the Day of Judgment. And by the way, there is no ijma' that that ayah also is Allah talking directly to them. Because in other places in the Qur'an, Allah says, وَلَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will not speak to them on the day of resurrection. In other words, even on that day, when Allah says, you, you who disbelieve, don't make excuses today, it is perhaps the angels saying it to them. It is perhaps the believers saying it to them. Even in that case, perhaps it's not even Allah Azza wa Jal addressing them. But in this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't talk to them, He tells His Messenger to talk to them, and the word He used for them is Al-Kafirun. Now, they were not saying that we reject your God. This is important. They were not saying that. Actually, if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, وَلَئِن سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will, Allah says, I swear they will definitely say Allah. They, the mushrikun will say Allah. So the, you know, kufr means I'm rejecting Allah. Shirk means I accept Allah, but I'm associating other partners. You guys know these basic definitions. So their crime from what we understand is that of shirk. But in this surah, Allah calls them al-kafirun. There's a, there's a difference. He didn't say, Ya ayyuhal mushrikun. And even though they were compromising, Allah still used such a strong term. Those who reject, those who deny, those who bury deep within. Why use this term? This is a question inshaAllah ta'ala that we're going to try and answer. The first thing here is that this, the, you know, who, who were these offers coming from? These offers of compromise, they were coming to the Messenger وسلم, from Aswad bin Abdul Muttalib, Umayyah bin Khalf, Walid, Walid bin Mukhira, Asi bin Wail, these leaders of Quraysh were coming and making all kinds of offers to the Prophet I've talked about this many, many, many uh, weeks before, a few, few months before, in the tafsir of Surah Abasa. That you know, making da'wah, making da'wah is kind of like sales. You have a precious product and you're trying to convince the other to take this product from you. But you know, typically, there is a big difference between sales and da'wah, by the way. But there is some parallel. You know, when you're making a sale, who's in the powerful position, the customer or the salesman? The customer. The customer. And especially if the salesman sounds desperate, like he's constantly trying to sell it to you, then the customer feels like, man, this guy is desperate. I should tell him, no, give me 50%. And you know what? Throw in this or that for free. You know, like nowadays you walk into a Toyota dealership, right? <laughs> After what recently happened. Who's desperate? The salesman. He's desperate. So these kuffar, they would think that the Prophet ﷺ is desperate. He's constantly making da'wah to us. He needs to give us this message. So we need to make some bargains. No, I'll, I'll buy your product, but just hear me out. How about this? You give me one year, I give you one year. You see, you see what I'm saying? They feel that the Prophet ﷺ is desperate to take it from them. And Allah tells His Messenger in the surah, No, you're not desperate. Actually, you don't even respond, I will respond. You just tell them what I'm telling you. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ And by using this word al-kafirun in the ism form, it's not al-ladhina kafiru, those who have disbelieved. Al-kafirun is, is a noun, it's an ism, it's an active participle, specifically called an ism fa'il. Those who are engaged now in disbelief, 
will be engaged in disbelief and have been engaged in disbelief. In, the, in other words, Allah is specifically talking to the people who are at the point of no return. You, you cemented kuffar, you cemented disbelievers, who it is very clear now that there's no way you're ever gonna change. And who is sure about that? It's not the Prophet who's sure. It is Allah who is sure, so He calls them al-kafirun. You see, when you say, أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا or يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا even, those who have disbelieved, that's in the past. That doesn't guarantee, maybe they'll believe in the future. It's possible. But when you call them al-kafirun, when you use that word, then there's no hope for them. That's it. They, they, say, their fate is sealed. Which answers an important question. This surah is not talking about all the kuffar. It's talking about specifically a group of kuffar who have been given the best opportunity to accept Islam. And let me tell you why I say the best opportunity to accept Islam. You know when somebody gives someone da'wah, they had an opportunity to accept Islam. But it, it also depends on how effective the da'wah was, how much barakah Allah put in the words of the da'i, you know, and environment, and also the character of the one presenting the da'wah. If the person making da'wah is, has good words but no character, then those words don't mean anything, you know? But who did this, these people, whose da'wah did they receive? Not just any speaker. This is the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And whose character did they see? For that, for years. Actually, not even for years, their entire life. They've known him since he was born. وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ Allah says, صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ Sahib, someone who's been with you all along. You, he's been with you your entire life. And so they saw his character and they saw his words. In other words, you cannot receive better da'wah than that. There will be no better da'i than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And when he has exhausted his efforts on you and you didn't budge, that means, according to Allah, you are at the point of no return. The only description left for you now is, Ya ayyuhal kafirun. Ya ayyuhal kafirun. So here we find, Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. You know, this kufr of theirs, like we said, we didn't, I didn't yet explain to you why Allah used the word kufr instead of shirk. Because the crime was actually shirk. But all these years, when they refused to leave their shirk, when they refused to leave their shirk, Refusal, rejection, denial. You know what these words are? Kufr. When you refuse it, that's kufr. Another meaning of the word kafir, in addition, and, and this is interesting, when Allah uses the word kufr in the Qur'an, He mentions kufr of what? Kufr of what? Or takdeeb of what? Right? So if they, you know, فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِاللَّهِ Whoever disbelieves in Allah. الَّذِينَ يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ أو بِرُسُلِهِ Right? So they, Allah, whoever disbelieves in Allah and His ayat, His revelations, or bil yawmil akhir in the last day, or in His messengers, or the messenger specifically, sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa alaihi wasallatu wasallam. In other words, when disbelief is mentioned, disbelief in what? But here Allah just said those who disbelieve, but He didn't mention what is it that they disbelieve in. In other words, it's all of these things. It's, you have disbelieved in Allah, even though you think you believe in Allah. You think you worship Allah at the Kaaba, but you don't. You don't really believe in Him. You disbelieve in this messenger sallallahu alaihi You have disbelieved in the ayat that came to you. You have disbelieved in your own conscience. We were born, all human beings were born with a fitrah. And in that fitrah, their, their, the ruh inside of us says, La ilaha illallah. It accepts Allah as the Rabb. Allah told us in the 172nd ayah of Surah Al-A'raf, He asked us this question before we even came on this earth. He said, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your master? Am I not your Lord? And what did all of us say? قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا We said, of course, we bear witness, we testify. In other words, we gave shahada before we even came here. So this Islam, this tawheed was already inside you, and you even denied what you had inside. Forget denying what is on the outside, you have even denied what is on the inside. And you've denied it permanently. So the word for you is al-kafirun. But there's another powerful meaning of the word, you know, of al-kafirun. And that is, that the word kufr comes in, in Arabic is not only used for rejection and denial and disbelief, it's also actually used for a denial of a favor. To deny a favor. Kufran and ni'ma they call it in Arabic. To be ungrateful to a favor. You are the people who receive the favor of Allah, especially because of the dua of Ibrahim. You received, الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ You received protection from Ashabul الْفِيلِ you got to go, you know, in, you know, 
You received all of these favors. And above all of these things, you received Allah's final messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You received the answer of the dua of Ibrahim. Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasulam minhum. You received that gift. Of all the people in the world that didn't receive the final messenger, you received it. And you are so ungrateful. So you are called the ultimately ungrateful. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Imam Razi, when commenting on this surah, he says the messenger, when, he, when his personality is described, what are the ayat? فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is by the mercy of Allah that you are, it is by the special mercy of Allah that you're lenient towards them. بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ When it comes to the believers, the messengers especially, especially with the believers, he's compassionate, he's always merciful. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We didn't send you as anything except a mercy for all the nations and all peoples of the world. And even when he's supposed to debate with them, he's supposed to be nice. وَجَادِلْهُمْ Debate them, argue them, بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ In the way that is best, in the most beautiful way. Debates are usually ugly. De- debates, are, if, you, if you've ever seen a debate, it gets ugly, it gets nasty. And the messenger is commanded, even when you debate them, debate in the most beautiful fashion. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What kind of, you know, mercy is this? Even when he was told to make da'wah, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Warn the closest of your family members. By the way, the toughest enemies of Islam were the close family members. The uncles, the tribal people, the people of his own tribe. These were the toughest enemies. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرِ إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ SubhanAllah. The messenger is told, I'm not asking you for any compensation, except I'm asking you to show love in close relations. I'm, show, I'm asking you not to be unfair to your own close relatives. This is one of the injustices that they used to commit. يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولُ بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ O Messenger, Allah tells His Messenger, O Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, convey what has been sent to you from your Master. وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ And if you don't do so, فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتَكَ Then you have not d- done your job, you haven't delivered the message that you were given. In other words, the Messenger is told, deliver, 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 deliver. And so much so, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةَ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ in Surah Hamim al-Sajda he says, even if you, the other shows animosity to you, he acts like an enemy to you, treat him in da'wah like he's your close intimate friend. This is the advice given by Allah to the Prophet wasallam. But these people have reached such a point that the messenger is told to say something that his soft heart can't even say. Those words cannot be his. So the word qul comes before. You can't say those things because you are soft. So you just say to them as I am telling you, Ya ayyuhal kafirun. Because those words indicate that the, the time of da'wah is done. The time, the, the period of da'wah is over. You know, if they were alladhina kafaru, maybe they'll change in the future. But al kafirun, al thabat, al ism, yashmil fihi al thabat. When the ism is used, when the noun is used, it's got constancy. You're gonna remain kuffar. And these are very heavy words for the Prophet himself to say sallallahu alayhi wa Because he came as a mercy and he's concerned for humanity. But even he was told, you must now say what you don't even like hearing yourself. Because that means that these people did not get the message and they will never get the message. These special brand of kuffar. They have not only lost all hope of Allah's mercy, but the messenger is no longer going to show them mercy. Whether he wants to or not. Which leads us to our next point. Just in that word qul, there are so many lessons. In that word qul that Allah Azza wa Jal used in the beginning. You see, the kuffar think like they have a choice. They can worship this god or that, that god. Maybe they want to pick this religion, maybe not. In other words, they have what they call nowadays freedom of religion, right? They can pick whatever they want. They can believe in it, disbelieve in it. The Messenger والسلام, is not presenting his opinion or his preference. What is he saying? قُلْ مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أُبَدِّلَهُ مِنْ تِلْقَاءِ نَفْسِي I don't have any authority to change what I am bringing to you on my own behalf. I have no authority. I'm not presenting you my point of view. I am presenting Allah's message. In other words, you feel like you can change or you can accept and reject. And then you're coming to me with compromise like I have the choice to make that decision. Right? Why don't you just take one year, we'll take one year. Like I'm the decision maker and the, Allah says, you're not gonna talk back to them, I will qul. Allah will talk back to them to let them know that He is in no position. He's not the one to be making these decisions. It is Allah's decision. He's only communicating them. And that's why He's called a messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A messenger doesn't make the decisions. He only delivers the message. The hukum. In al hukmu illa lillah. The decision, the command only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is being communicated to the kuffar through the word qul. There's no room for compromise. Not with me. 
And then we, we talked about the few things that they uh, uh, disbelieved in. Now we're going to go, actually I addressed this question also, but I'm going to repeat it just so it's organized discussion. Who is this surah talking to? Please understand, this is not for all kafirun. This is not for everybody who disbelieves. This is not for your neighbor. This is not for the Jews and the Christians. This is specifically, specifically being used for a group of people who received the special favor of Allah for generations, and then the most special favor of Allah, the final messenger, and on top of that, the final revelation itself, they got to hear it with their own ears, from the mouth of the messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa and they still refuse to disbelieve, refuse to believe, after years and years of endless attempt, it is at that point that they get this title. Why am I saying that? Because we nowadays are so careless in how we understand the Qur'an, and how we communicate the message of the Qur'an to others. In other words, we think these surahs, we can just use them, how, you know, I'm, I met a non-Muslim, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا It's not that simple. We shouldn't oversimplify the religion, especially when it comes to the word of Allah. We can't be careless in how we apply it, and who it applies to. We have to be very, very clear. These scholars are saying, مَخْصُوصُونَ الْمُخَاطِبُونَ كَفَرَ مَخْصُوصُونَ قَدْ عَلِمَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُمْ أَلَّهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Look at the comments of Ash-Shawkani and Zamakhshari. He says, this is a, these are kuffar that are specific. And Allah already knew that they will never believe. In other words, the only one who knows that they will be kafir forever is Allah. You don't have the right to use that word. You can't just throw that word around just to anybody. It's a careful thing to use. Inshallah ta'ala, when we get to the ayat of, you know, uh, how to judge people, and that, that comes in Madani Qur'an more clearly, then we'll have this discussion in full. So, you know, and by the way, this, this kufr that Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about, the context of it, I gave you one issue. One issue was, they said, well, you follow one year, we'll follow the other year. So, na'budu ilahaka sana, wa ta'bud alihatuna alihatana sana. We worship your God one year, and we, we will join together the other year. Now, so, in other words, what, what I'm trying to get at is, there's one year of shirk and one year of Islam, according to their proposal, right? So, there are two proposals. There are two proposals. And there are two rejections. You know how the ayahs have repetition in the surah? وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدْ And then again later on, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدْ There were two proposals, both of them are being rejected. Ulama well, have commented in terms of language, because they made two offers, two rejections came. In other words, they came with one offer, rejection. They came with the other offer, rejection. <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. It's not just random repetition in the surah, and we'll see the benefits of the repetition as the surah as, as our study continues. Then, what's really beautiful is how the Prophet ﷺ delivered these ayat. It's a Meccan surah. Mufassirun tell us the context of revelation. فَقَامَ عَلَى رُؤُوسِهِمْ فَقَرَأَهَا عَلَيْهِمْ He stood on their heads. Basically, he came right up to them. They're having their little meeting. The leaders of Quraysh, he walks right up to them and says to their face, Ya ayyuhal kafirun. Do you understand what this means? He didn't call them Ya Ahli, Ya Quraysh. Right? Ya Ahla Makkah. He used the words Ya ayyuhal kafirun. In other words, you have rejected me and I am rejecting you. He's den- In modern terms, you call this, I'm renouncing my citizenship. I have nothing to do with you. I'm completely denouncing, disassociating, disassociating myself from you. So, this, you know, complete, complete separation between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, the Prophet and those who don't believe anymore, this is pretty much a declaration of war. This is what you call a declaration of war. I have nothing to do with you, you have completely rejected. And I'm not even gonna call you with a dignified name, I will just call you Al-Kafirun from now. And it's not even me, I've been commanded. It's not, I've been commanded. So in this word قُلْ, there is one, an insult to the kuffar. Why? Allah hates them so much at this point, He doesn't even talk to them directly. At the same time, there's an award to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, you know that the kuffar believed that the Prophet sallallahu is very truthful? Even when they called him a liar, they didn't really think like that on, on the inside. That was just one of the propaganda schemes. But they knew, this man just doesn't lie. So when he comes and says to calls them al-kafirun, then if there's any ounce of goodness left inside of them, they would, they, this would hurt extra. Because you know, what I'm trying to get at is there are two kinds of people who insult you. There's a person who's known to use bad language, and they, you, they're, they're known for insulting other people, and using bad words towards them, and they come and say something to you. You say, man, whatever, this guy does like that to everybody. But who's coming and calling them kafir? 
The one who only used is the best language. So what would make that person say these words? How bad do you have to be that the Prophet ﷺ is told to use those words for you? You understand? It adds a level of disgust and, and ugliness to the attribution made to these people. That Allah told specifically His Messenger to call them Al-Kafirun. Because of His character, His noble character. You know when someone who's really extra extra nice, they use bad language or they use this, you know, this, this harsh tone with you, then it just comes to you unexpected. And you feel really really bad about yourself. Really bad about yourself. But if someone despicable or low character, they use bad words towards you or they're harsh towards you, you say, whatever, this guy, I should just take it, you know, take it in stride. I don't have to worry about it, you know. So the fact that even the messenger said it in and of itself is an additional insult. Then a special comment about the word al-kafirun. وَهُوَ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُمْ يَغْضِبُونَ مِنْ أَنْ يُنْسَبُوا إِلَىٰ ذَلِكَ it was already known, and the Prophet himself knew that when you call them that word, it's going to make them angry. دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ مَحْرُوسٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ لَا يُبَالِي بِهِمْ لَا بِتَوَاغِيهِمْ It is a proof that Allah at this point does not care to offend them. Before it was, be soft to them. Even if they come to you as an enemy, treat them like a friend. Give them da'wah softly. At this point, Allah does not care about them. So He's using the harshest tone with them. In other words, the door to da'wah for these people is closed. And if the doors, doors to da'wah are closed, it also means the doors to the, the Prophet's mercy is closed on you. The Prophet's mercy is no longer on your side. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now as far as the word ya ayyuha. Ya ayyuha in Arabic is used in a couple of settings. One, it is used in formal settings. In other words, you don't use ya ayyuha to someone like a child. You know, in, in classical Arabic. Ya walad. If you say ya ayyuha walad, you're giving him extra respect and dignity or formality. The Prophet is spoken to with this extra dignity and formality when Allah says, Ya ayyuhal rasul, Ya ayyuhal nabi, Ya ayyuhal muzzamil. Even the believers are given this dignity, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. But ayyuha has another uh, uh, you know, aspect to it, which is that of removing all, you know, it's not small talk, it's a serious matter. When it's a serious matter, ayyuha is used in Arabic. And when there's only formality and distancing. In other words, when you say, Ya walad, there's an intimacy between you and the child. You're close to the child. But if you say, Ya ayyuhal walad, there's a distance between you and them. Allah uses, Ya ayyuhal kafirun. Distancing himself from them. And even in those words, فَهُوَ إِعْلَانٌ لِقَطْعِ الْعَلَاقَاتِ كُلِّهَا It is an announcement of all severing of all relationships with them. At this point, I have nothing to do with you, and you have nothing to do with me. That's already in the first ayah. And a lot of times we think this comes in the last ayah of this surah, when we say, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ But this is already in the first ayah, in just ayyuha. In just the word al-kafirun, in just the word qul. That separation is already there, subhanallah. Now, فَبِهَادَ الطَّرِيقِ تَدُلُّ هَذِهِ الْكَلِمَةَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الَّذِي قَالُوهُ وَطَلَبُوهُ مِنَ الرَّسُولِ أَمْرٌ مُنْكَرْ فِي غَايَةِ الْقَبْحِ وَنِهَايَةِ الْفَحْشِ In other words, when Allah says, tell them, يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ That language from Allah already illustrates how disgusted Allah is with the compromise proposal they came up with. He is so disgusted with them, instead of saying, say no to their proposal, tell them, you disbelievers, you rejectors. You know, and it's almost a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is waged against them. So this is the anger of Allah manifest in these words. Now, the next ayah, لا أعبد ما تعبدون To understand this ayah properly, we have to understand a couple of things. The first of them is the definition of ibadah. ibadah. And I'm going to go through it rather quickly because I've talked about it in other places. And this is just a time for recap. The few aspects inside the word, inside ibadah are, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah lists five things. It's a good definition. It's a pretty mainstream comprehensive definition. To be a abd of Allah, to be a slave of Allah, you need to fulfill five conditions. You need to have obedience to Allah, ita'a, right? You have to have obedience to Allah. And what that means is, if there's obedience to Allah and obedience to another, anything other than Allah, then obedience to Allah comes first. And you can only obey Allah's creation so long as it also means you're at the same time obeying Allah. In other words, if you obey a creation while disobeying Allah, then this is already shirk, you're no longer abd. لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There's no obeying creation at the same time disobeying the Creator. That can't be. That cannot be as a, for, for Abd. So the first is ita'a. The second is uh, uh, love, hub. We have to love Allah Azza wa Jal. 
more than anything else. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe are intense in their love for Allah. Allah says in that surah, you know, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ there are people who, besides Allah, they take competitors, loving them like they should be loving Allah. But those who believe, they're intense in their love for Allah. In other words, we have love for our spouse, we have love for our children, our parents, our family, our friends, our wealth, our assets, but all of them come under the love of Allah. They come under the love of Allah Azza wa And after him, the love of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa The second condition was love. So we have obedience and we have love. The third is tawakkul. We have to trust the master. He, I've accepted myself as the slave, I've accepted him as the master, so whatever instructions he gives me, I have to trust that they are better for me. Whatever situation he's putting me through, I have to trust him. I have to trust him in that if I obey him, no matter how hard I think it is, it's actually the better alternative. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah intends to make life easier for you, to lighten your burden. We think by following Allah, life becomes hard, and by disobeying Him, life becomes easy. A lot of times in our families, we think, man, everything's haram. It's so hard. Islam is so hard. Allah says, no, I actually give you Islam to make your life easier. And we have to trust that that is true. We have to trust Allah. Tawakkul in Allah. So now we have obedience, we have love, and we have trust. We have trust. The fourth is sincerity. Sincerity. When we do something, we have to do it for the sake, when we, especially an act of ibadah, we have to do it for the sake of Allah. And you cannot mix with Allah other things. If you're gonna give sadaqah to the masjid, for example, and you can't say, yeah, it's a good tax write-off. And it's good sadaqah. You can't mix, you know, when you're gonna give it, it is only, now if you get the benefit, well and good, but in your intention, it can only be for Allah. Allah doesn't like to share in the intentions. He doesn't like to share in the intentions. And actually the demand that is put upon us in salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillah rabbil alameen. This sincerity is also talked about in the previous surah. فَصَلِّي لِي Rabbik, Make salah sincerely to your master, to your Rabb. So sincerity. You're cleansing our intentions to do something purely for the sake of Allah. Sometimes for example, and I'm, this is a side comment but an important one nonetheless, we serve our deen in many capacities. Maybe you're helping out at the masjid. Maybe you're at an MSA. Maybe you're at some da'wah organization. Maybe you're at an Islamic school. Maybe you're helping out with a website. Whatever project it is, you're trying to help the deen out in some way. And in the beginning, it's for the sake of Allah. But over time, you say, man, people don't listen to me. I should be in charge. And your ego comes in. And people don't recognize what I'm doing. Nobody thanks me, man. Nobody listens to my opinion and nobody appreciates everything I've done so far. Now is it for the sake of Allah or for the sake of appreciation? What, and nobody realizes it. You don't realize it, over time it happens. You started out with sincere intentions and they get messed up over time. We have to maintain ikhlas. We have to maintain this sincerity. And the final and the most important that has to do with this matter right now. We had four so far and the fifth one's missing, right? We call, in simple terms, I call it the terms of slavery. The terms of slavery. You know when you get a job, between you and your company, there's a contract. The contract tells you this is what we owe you and this is what you owe us. Between the husband and the wife, there's a contract. This is what I'm gonna do for you, this is what you're gonna do for me. There's a contract, there's an exchange. Between the parent and child, Allah gave us rights. These are my rights, these are your rights. There's an exchange, there's an understanding. Between a government and the people, there's an understanding. You're gonna pay taxes, you're gonna abide by these laws and I'll provide you these services. There's an exchange. But usually these exchanges are a result of compromise. In other words, both parties come and discuss and they say, okay, these are your rights and these are my rights and there's compromise. But when we are slaves to Allah, where do these terms and conditions come from? Are they a result of some discussion and compromise? No. These come from above, you just take them. In other words, you are in no position to define what does it mean to be a slave of Allah? What does it mean to worship Allah? What does it mean to obey Allah? You cannot define that for yourself. Those definitions, those terms and conditions are only coming from Allah. And that's what makes you a slave, that you have no say in the terms and conditions. Only Allah does. Now, the kuffar are worshipping Allah. They're doing tawaf. They're making sajda. They call Allah's name. But the terms, what they call obedience to Allah, what they call believing in Allah, they come up with that themselves. But Allah says, if you come up with it yourself, it's unacceptable. The only way it's acceptable if those terms come from me. And the ones that come from him are the ones that the messenger has been given. 
You understand? So these terms, it's very important. Somebody tells you at your job, yeah, man, I, I, I love God. Or I worship Him. I worship God. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because if you worship God on your own, the way you want, then you're not Allah's slave. When you worship God the way He wants you to worship Him, now that's worshiping God. You understand? The terms are defined by Allah. What does it mean to believe in Allah? What does it mean to obey Allah? What does it mean to worship Allah? This is the first discussion. The, the conditions of slavery. The second, I want you to understand the word ibadah in Arabic or ubudiyah, the, the masdar. It includes two things. If I translate them as one of those two things, it's incomplete. It's a limitation of, of English uh, as opposed to classical Arabic. Classical Arabic com you know, combines many concepts at the same time. And so if we, if we just look at a partial translation or partial meaning of the concept, there's confusion left in the mind. The two terms that, Im that completely or comprehensively cover all aspects of ibadah or ubudiyah are two things. Those are worship and slavery. There are two terms, worship and slavery. A lot of times we either take worship or we take slavery, but there are two separate things in English, but they're combined in Arabic into the word ibadah and ubudiyah. So when, when the Messenger says, لا أعبدوا ما تعبدون It doesn't just mean I will not worship. Also, I will not be enslaved to. I will not become a slave of. Very briefly, I'll remind you of the difference between worship and slavery. When Maghrib happened, we worshipped Allah. When Isha comes up, we will worship Allah. But in between the prayers, what are we? Slaves of Allah. When you're sleeping, you're not worshipping, but you're still a slave. When you wake up and you're driving to work, brushing your teeth, eating your breakfast, you know, parking your car, even if you're not reciting Quran or you're, you're, not work, you know, you're not doing an act of worship, you are still what? A slave. In other words, worship is specific acts. The act of fasting, the act of praying, the act of making hajj, the act of reciting Quran, the act of giving sadaqah, these are acts of worship. But a slave is a slave all the time, whether he does those acts or not. This concept is very powerful. It means we, we are to live according to what Allah, how Allah wants us to live, not just in Jumu'ah during the khutbah, and when the salah is going on. We are enslaved to Allah in between the prayers too. حَافِلُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى In the Salat al-Wusta, some commentary says it's between the prayers. Be connected to Allah too. You know what happens a lot of times? People worship Allah, but they still don't act like His slave. They'll worship Allah, they'll come pray Asr. I'll say, I got time for Maghrib, let me go catch a movie. And they come back from Maghrib. So they worshipped Allah, but they didn't act like what? Didn't act like a slave. Somebody owns a liquor store, comes to the Salah for five times. He worships Allah, but he's clearly not acting like what? A slave, he's not obeying Allah. And sometimes because we have these partial English definitions, you know what happens? We feel, we think to ourselves, hey, at least I worship him. At least I worship him, so I, my job is done. No, but you worshipped him, but you're still not a abd of Allah. Worship is one part, slavery is the other. Ibadah includes both. Now the Arabs, they had two problems. There are two problems. They refuse to worship Allah, but you know what the bigger problem is? They refuse to be Allah's slaves. There are two problems in this surah. We have to make those problems distinct. The prob the, when they refuse to bow down only to Allah and get rid of all the idols, what is that a problem of? Worship or slavery? That's a problem of worship. But when they refuse to give the orphan, when they refuse to not kill the baby girl, when they refuse to not feed the poor, when they refuse to not give justice, when they refuse to kill without having right to do so, when they abuse the slave, when they do all of these things, what are they refusing to do? They're refusing to act like Allah's slaves. Being Allah's slave includes you worship Him and you act like His slave. Two things. So now understand the ayah. لا أعبد ما تعبدون. By the way, what time is the Aisha prayer? 9.15? Okay. So we, I think we hear quite a bit done inshallah. Hopefully even before the salah we might be finished. So لا أعبد ما تعبدون. لا أعبد I will not be enslaved to and I will not worship what you have been worshipping. Now we have to understand, Allah, in this ayah, the messenger is being told to talk about what they worship and what they are slaves of. So what is it that they worship? And what is it that they're slaves of? They're worshippers of idols, false gods. And they are slaves of their own desires. 
Two things. They worship the idols, and they are slaves of their own selves, their own hawa, their own nafs. And the messenger says, I refuse to worship your idols, and I refuse to be enslaved to my own desires. I refuse both of those things. I am not, I'm never going to. Now, they, the, the mushrikun said, he's been rejecting our religion for a decade now almost. Let's give him a compromise, maybe the future. The Mecca has become pretty tense, you know. Always this confrontation between the Muslims and, non, and the kuffar. Let's make a compromise, life will become better. Their idea is we want harmony in society, from their point of view. And if we compromise, things will get better. There won't be any tension in Mecca anymore. So our future will be better. لا أعبدو, according to most grammarians, the لا on the mudara actually more than present illustrates the future. In other words, the messenger says, don't have your hopes up. I am not going to. It's never going to happen. I will never, if you're thinking the future is going to be softer on you, I will never worship, and I will refuse to be enslaved to whatever you worship and you are enslaved to. That is never going to happen. Get that out of your head. Then come to the next ayah. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ And by the way, you are not at all worshippers of, nor are you enslaved to. Now, عَابِدُونَ is an ism, is a noun here. What that signifies is, you have never been in the past, you are not now, and you will never be in the future, in any way, shape, or form, worshipping the same God I do, or be enslaved to the same God I am enslaved, of, enslaved to. That has never ever ever happened, and that will never ever ever happen. In other words, this is a guarantee that you will remain in kufr. To understand this ayah properly, why would Allah say they will remain in kufr? Why will they never believe? These specific leaders of Quraysh, why would Allah curse them in this way? The answer lies elsewhere in the Qur'an. Allah says, Am abramu amran fa inna mubrimun. Very important ayah. Am abramu amran fa inna mubrimun. To understand this ayah, you have to understand a very, very important piece of vocabulary. The Arabic word is ibram. Ibram. Ibram means to tie a rope for construction. You know, in the old days, they didn't have cement. They didn't have cement. So you have two pieces of wood. How do you hold them together? You tie them up. But you can't take a weak rope. You have to take a rope and you have to double it. You know how you coil the rope? And then you twist it. That makes it stronger. Then you wrap it up twice this way, twice that way. You don't even knot it once. How many times do you knot it? Twice at least to make it strong. Meaning every part of this process is double, 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 double. To ensure that this rope will never be loose. That is the word Allah uses to describe the commitment of the kuffar to remain kuffar. Am abramu amran? Have they tied their rope when it comes to this decision? Are they that sure that they will never ever turn back? Because once you tie that rope, the intention is you never want to untie it. It's not like your shoelace that you want to untie eventually, right? Allah says, are they so sure about the decision to remain kuffar that they'll never go back on that decision? Is that the case? And if that is the case, فَإِنَّا مُبْرِمُونَ Then we have tied up our rope also. If they are so sure, that I am sure that I will leave them in kufr. And by the way, when they tied their rope, Allah Azza wa Jal used a fi'l, am abramu al fi'l al-madi, past tense. When Allah tied His rope, He used a noun. And you know the difference between a verb and a noun? A verb is temporary and a noun is permanent. In other words, even though they are sure they will never want to untie this rope and become believers, when they come before their own actions on the Day of Judgment, you know what's gonna happen, right? رُبَمَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ كَانُوا مُسْلِمِينَ Perhaps disbelievers will wish they had been Muslims, they'll try to untie their rope. But that's, it's too late then, it's too late. And so Allah says, فَإِنَّا مُبْرِمُونَ My rope is permanently tied. The noun is used, is done, it's finished. And that was hypothetical. Is it the case that they've tied their rope? But here it is the case. Allah says al kafirun so it is the case. In other words, they made up their mind in fact. So Allah has made up their mind that not, never, don't be confused. You have never been worshipping what I did. Don't think that even before I was a messenger, we were on the same religion. No, 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 no. You were not. Wala antum abidun. You were never worshipping, ever. Nor are you now, nor will you ever. What I am enslaved to now. A'budu is the present tense for the Prophet ﷺ. Very, very beautiful thing. You know what the word A'budu in the present tense signifies? He didn't mention his own past, he only mentioned his present. And that's beautiful, you know why? He never did shirk. The Prophet ﷺ never did shirk, we know that. But he really truly became Allah's slave when the revelation came. He was looking for it. 
وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى We found you seeking and we guided you. Guided you to what? To be a slave. Guidance and being Allah's slave go together. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Immediately what? إِهْدِنَا عِبَادَة إِهْدِنَا هِدَايَة So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, now I have found true slavery. But even before this, you guys think we were on the same religion? No, we were never. Don't be confused about that. And what the powerful lesson here is, if you know that I've never been on your religion, and you're never going to be, you're never going to be in this, uh, you know, you're, you're never going to be worshippers of I am, we are set in our ways. So these two ayat actually have to do with the future now. These two ayat together, more than the past, they deal with the future. I will not be compromising, and you it is permanent that you're not going to be compromising. You're never going to be coming to the slavery of Allah and the worship of Allah. وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ Now we turn to the past. Two ayat were for the future, now two ayat for the past. وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ And I am not a worshipper of. I am not a worshipper of. In other words, I have never ever been enslaved to مَا عَبَدْتُمْ What you have been worshipping. Don't think, first of all, don't think that your God was the same as mine, and also don't think my God was the same as yours. The one I was worshipping even before was never the same as yours. So if I've never worshipped your God before, before even wahi came, I was disgusted by your religion. After the revelation has come to you, to, to me, you expect me to compromise now? <laughs> if I never even did shirk before this revelation came, it is even more impossible for me now that this revelation has come. So there's no way I will ever, ever compromise. وَلَا أَنَا عَبِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ what you've been worshipping, I, was, I wasn't even doing that to begin with. And now tied to the past, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Now here we have to understand something, uh, that repetition we talked about before, but the second one for the past. The first, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ for the future. The second, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ for the past. The other was one for one compromise, and the other for the other compromise. We understood the repetition of these ayat. The third way to understand this repetition is, when you go to someone and you declare animosity, then you use the harshest tone. And part of being harsh with someone is to repeat your words of animosity. I hate you, I hate you. I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill you. When you repeat yourself, what does that mean? It illustrates anger. It illustrates I'm not, did you hear me? Did you get that? I'm never turning. Did you get it? I am never turning back. When you repeat yourself in this way, this is the messenger's way, Allah's way of telling the messenger to communicate to them, they better get it right. If they didn't hear you correctly the first time, tell them again. This is a means of like very harsh tone speech. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Now, the word ma, very important. You know Allah didn't say, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَنْ أَعْبُدُ And you will not worship who I, who I worship. He said, what I worship. The word what is not used for living things, it's used for non-living things. Who is used for living things. So it causes a confusion. How come instead of saying who I worship, and I'm using worship loosely, now you know worship and I'm enslaved to, the, the full word version you know. I'm using it to be brief. Instead of saying who I worship, Allah makes twice the messenger say what I worship. This what could be ma masdariya. This is one way to understand it. To make it simple for you, what worship I do. I'll put it in English terms so you understand. Ma abudu, meaning abudu ibadati. In other words, the worship that I do. What worship I do, you will never do. That's what the word what here means. The kind, the form of worship and slavery to Allah I have taken, you will never take. What it means for me to be a slave of Allah and a worshiper of Allah, and what it means for you is completely different. That's the one one meaning of ma. The second meaning of ma, if it's taken as mausula, it's lit ta'ajjub. What an amazing God I worship, and what pathetic falsehood you worship. When you say what, in regards to Allah, it does two things to clarify the subject. The difference between who and what. When you ask the question who, you're looking for an identity. You're looking for an identity. When you ask the question what, you are looking for qualities. When you say who is he, who is he? You say he's Abdul Karim. He's Sharif, he's Ahmed. What is he? When you say what is he, what's the answer? He's an accountant, he's a programmer, he's a nice guy, whatever, right? In other words, when you say who, who, and by the way, accountants may not be nice guys, I don't know. But 
Who? Who is to find out identity? What is to find out? Quality. You understand? When ma is used, what's the question about? Identity or quality? It's about quality. What an amazing God I worship. What I worship is the truth, the true God. So his quality is being highlighted. And then when ma is used for them, wala ana abidu ma abattum ma abattum. What pathetic falsehoods you're following? What are the qualities of what you follow, and what are the qualities of the one I follow? That's the word ma here. It's beautiful. Wala ana abidu ma abattum. Wala antum abidu na ma abud. You think you're worshiping the same amazing Allah that I worship? You think that's that can be attributed to Allah? Your acts? Never. And do you think the things I do, the service I do to my master, you think that is comparable to what pathetic gods you have in front of you? Never. And that difference is made infinitely wide by the use of the word ma. The mahiyah, the nature of the God Allah, Allah's Messenger worships. Who Allah is, what Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is highlighted in the word ma. So it's not only ma mastari as ma lit ta'ajjub also. It's a powerful, powerful thing used in, in this ayah. Now we come to the final uh, ayah. And here we learn something just incredibly beautiful. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ Probably one of the most misunderstood ayat in the Qur'an in our times. Commonly translated, to you be your religion, to me be mine. To you be your religion, to me be mine. First of all, لَكُمْ is early, is you know, اختصاص. In other words, جَارْ وَمَجْرُورْ مُقَدَّمْ Allah didn't say, دِينُكُمْ لَكُمْ وَدِينِي لِي لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دِينِ Your way of life, and I'm only oversimplifying right now as religion, your religion is only for you. It's only for you. In other words, it's never ever going to be for me. I said the word only on purpose, because لَكُمْ is early. If, if it was after دِينُكُمْ, it wouldn't be the word only. It is only for you people. وَلِيَ دِينِ And my deen at this point is, only for me when it comes to you. In other words, between you and I, there's never going to be an exchange. The time for exchange is finished. In other words, I am leaving this town. These are, these, these are the ayat that are the precursors to the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because when da'wah is done, there's no time for da'wah left with these people. What has to happen now? Hijrah. Because the only purpose of the messenger in Mecca is what? Is da'wah. But if he said, no, the doors are closed. The doors are closed. Then basically, he's already renounced his citizenship like we said before. So he can't really... Sur- and by the way, when these words come, do they get even worse in their animosity against him? Absolutely. Similar words have come elsewhere in the Qur'an. قُلْ يَا قَوْمِ اعْمَلُوا عَلَى, مكان- عَلَى مَكَانَتِكُمْ Tell them, my nation, do whatever you're gonna do from your place. Stay, in your, stay on your position and do whatever it is you're gonna do. Inni amil, I'm working also. I'm doing what I can also. Let's see who comes out on top. Now let's understand these ayat in, in the few minutes that we have before I break for salah. Let's understand these ayat from one more perspective and we'll tie the surah up and complete that final 10 minute lesson after the salah inshaAllah ta'ala almost immediately. The word deen. The word deen in Arabic comes from the word dain. It means loan. The word dain in Arabic means loan. Something that is owed to you, or something you owe someone in precise terms. The word deen is also used in Arabic for government, because the government gives the people what they owe, and the gov- people give the government what they owe. It's an exchange, it's a precise exchange. And a deen necessitates an authority. Also, the day of judgment, when people get exactly what they deserve, and pay exactly what they owe, is also called yawm ad deen Maliki yawm ad deen one of the meanings of lakum dinukum wal yadin is you will get exactly what you deserve. Your judgment will be only for you. And my judgment will be only for me. And you'll find out what the consequences of your kufr are when the day of deen comes. That's part of the meaning of, of deen here. Lakum dinukum wal yadin, your judgment is for you, and my judgment is only for me. Subhanallah. Go ahead. It's open challenge. You want to head for hell? Your hellfire is only for you at this point. In this group, these people who have been you know, bent upon kufr, a special judgment is for you, and my special judgment as a messenger is for me. Let's see who comes out on top. It's an open challenge. The other thing, the final thing before I let you go, inshaAllah ta'ala, in this case, in lakum dinukum wal yadin, some have misunderstood this to mean that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't care that they will do shirk. You go your way, I go mine, I'll mind my own business, you mind your own business. This is a misinterpretation and a misreading of the ayah. It's a misreading of the ayah. 
When was this ayah revealed? After decades upon a decade, a decade of da'wah directly. After a decade of da'wah. And at that point, what they're being told is, you keep it up. You keep doing what you're doing. And I'm going to keep what, doing what I'm doing. And eventually, now we're not going to collide with words. We're going to end up colliding with the sword. In other words, this, this is almost a precursor to the conflict that is about to come. In lakum dinukum wal yadin. You know why there's a conflict embedded inside these words? Because where is the where are the mushrikun keeping their idols? They're keeping them at the haram. And what is the messenger's job? We talked about the legacy of the Prophet. ﷺ. What is his legacy? To purify the religion of Ibrahim. ﷺ. And what's his job? How, how can he do so? To reconstitute the house of Allah for the purpose for which it was built. He cannot do that so long as what is there? So long as the idols are there, the mission isn't done. In order for his deen to be complete, their deen has to go. You keep doing your deen, I'll keep doing my deen, and we'll see who comes out on top. So Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ He sent his messenger, Allah is the one who sent his messenger with guidance. And the deen, وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ and he sent him with the deen of al-haq, the deen, the, the, the judgment of truth, the religion of truth. لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ So it may overshadow and overcome and encompass all the other deen there is. Any other form will be overshadowed and overcome. وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Even if the mushrikun hate it. Even if the mushrikun hate it. So you keep doing what you're doing, but it's gonna be overcome. My deen has already been guaranteed. And by the way, this word deen will become even clearer in the next ayah. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ Deen comes up again. And there we will learn when this conflict is announced in this surah, what is happening in the next surah, who's gonna be winning this conflict. But the final lesson of this surah, inshaAllah ta'ala, I'll share with you right after the salah. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ وَنَفَعْنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِالْآيَاتِ وَذِكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ رَحْمَةُ الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد uh, we are discussing the final ayah of سورة الكافرون and we're making two additional uh, comments إن شاء الله تعالى before I get to the final comment uh, the first of them is in the previous سورة a personal attack was made against the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and his family uh, with use of the word Batara Muhammadun Ma'adullah that the Prophet's family is cut off and his name won't last and you recall that from our discussion from the last couple of weeks and in response in this surah Allah Azza wa Jal did not say to the, all of the believers because it, it's not just the, the, the messenger himself وسلم, but it's also وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ those who are with him they are also not going to worship what these people worship they are also in rejection of this but because they thought that the Prophet by himself isn't strong enough and the fact that if his lineage is cut off, he's just by himself alone. Allah Azza wa Jal in this case highlighted that even the messenger alone is enough for you people. So he doesn't say, Qulu ya ayyuhal kafirun. All of you say, ayyuhal kafirun. No. And not even, la na'budu ma ta'budun. We do not worship what you. No. Qul. You alone say to them. You stand up to them alone. You know, these, this is a lesson in the Quran. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in, we sometimes, from a historical point of view, people will say that the non-Muslim, the disbeliever will say that Muhammad, you know, he was a great leader, but he was nothing without his followers. Ma'adullah, they use language like that. Muslims don't use that language, but non-Muslim historians do, right? That he depended on his followers. Now look at the wording of Allah. إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهِ In Surah At-Tawbah, if you don't help him, he tells the Sahaba, if you don't help him, Allah has already helped him. Allah has already helped him sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that's not our attitude. Our attitude is he has already gotten the help from Allah. You remember in the battle of Hunayn, the, some of the sahaba got shocked and they ran off and he was by himself and the archers are above on the hill. And he's just standing there saying, Ana rasulu la kathib. I'm the messenger. You know, I'm the son of you know, Abdul Muttalib. I'm the messenger, I'm not a liar. And he stood there by himself, sallallahu alayhi wa This is the courage Allah has given his messenger, alayhi salatu wa salam. This is the first thing. The second thing is I told you that, you know, they were looking to compromise with the messenger. But Allah tells him that he's not the one you should be dealing with. This is, these are my decisions. He's only communicating my decisions to you. So it doesn't begin, ya ayyuhal kafirun, it begins, qul. In other words, those words aren't even mine. Allah is telling me what to tell you. 
How am I going to be the one to make these decisions? So, at the end of the ayah, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دين, That noon at the end of deen is actually dini. Dini. You have your deen and I have my deen. And there's a ya lil mutakallim. It's, it's an idafa, right? So you put a ya at the end. And for rhetorical reasons, the ya is removed. There's no ya there anymore. There's only kasra now. If you read the mushaf, it'll be لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دِينِ There's just a kasra there. So the ya is removed, right? This is this uh, a kind of hadhaf, it's called hadhaf in Arabic, a mission to take a word out, is used for several purposes. One of them is for exclamation. For exclamation. In other words, when you're excited and you say something like this, emphatically, then you don't say dini, you say dini. Similarly, when we beg Allah Azza wa Jal, we don't say rabbi, we say rabbi. Rabbi ghfirli. Rabbi is short. Why is it short? Because we're desperate before Allah Azza wa and it's a, it's, a, it's a cry to Allah. Here, that's one of the reasons is, is the emphatic power with which the Messenger is declaring that this is my deen. The other is his, the Ya would refer to the Messenger والسلام, and his role has been minimized Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this declaration as Allah's role from the very beginning has been maximized. Allah's role has been maximized with the word Qul. And by removing the Ya at the end, it is as though Allah is saying, in the end even, you don't mention yourself much. It's not really you who's making this decision. It's not really you, subhanAllah. It's a very beautiful and powerful and eloquent uh, uh, conclusion to the surah. And here's the third and the most important point that I wanted to leave you with, inshaAllah. I've been telling you all along in these last 10 surahs that they are not only a good depiction of the seerah, of the Prophet ﷺ, but at the same time, the connection of the legacy of Rasulullah tied to the legacy of which messenger? Ibrahim ﷺ. Now listen, I'm taking you to another place in the Quran. I'm going to translate just a few words from this long ayah. قَدْ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي Ibrahim. That already there is a beautiful model for all of you, especially in the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ And those who were with him. إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ When they said to their nation, إِنَّا بُرَاءٌ مِّنْكُمْ وَمِمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ We are completely disassociating ourselves from you, no doubt about it. Listen to these words carefully. They said, there is no doubt we are disassociating ourselves from you and from er and what you worship, anything besides Allah. Anything that you worship besides Allah, whatever it may be, we are cutting ourselves off from you and your worship. Sound familiar? SubhanAllah. And he goes, Kafarna bikum, we have disbelieved in you. In other words, we are doing kufr of you people <laughs> and your religion. Wabada baynana wa baynakum al adawatu wal bagdau abadan. And now Animosity and hatred has, has been born between us and you forever. For that group in particular. Hatta tu'minu billahi wahdahu until you believe in Allah, the one and only. SubhanAllah. And the ayah goes on about the exception of Ibrahim and he made dua for his father. When he made dua for his father. But look at the ayat. Isn't this another depiction of Surah Al-Kafirun? And how the Messenger deals with the Quraysh? He is repeating even in his animosity against the Quraysh, repeating the legacy of Ibrahim salam. Not just in فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرُ SubhanAllah! How beautifully Allah ties lessons together in the Qur'an. وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ This is how we, we explain the ayat. How beautifully things come together. How incredibly well history connects. And here you further appreciate what I said just a few minutes before what I said. The Messenger was told to speak alone. He was told to speak alone. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, who had very few followers, even he was told to speak with the believers that were with him. The irony, you know the contrast. Who has more followers? Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. And Ibrahim has a few followers. We know this from history. We have, you know, barely ever mentioning his followers. He, actually, he himself, he himself is called ummatan. He by himself is called an ummah. But the few followers he had, he was supposed to stand together with them and then speak up to his nation. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who has many more followers than him, he's asked, no, 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 you go speak alone. You go speak by yourself. Because they need to see what you're made of. They need to see that they cannot be talking to you in this way. Sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah azza wa give us an appreciation of the Qur'an, an understanding of it, and a love of his messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.